William Dean Howells is one of three authors that we have this week, and of the three of them, probably the one you have heard of the least will be William Dean Howells. However, in his day, he was perhaps the most important figure in American literature in the sense that he was a novelist, a playwright, a magazine editor of important magazines that set kind of the standard for uh, literature in this period of time. And he was an extraordinarily widely read critic of literature and art and <clears throat> uh, things that had to do with culture in this period of time. Um, he's a really interesting man. His reputation has waned uh, in the last hundred years or so since he's died, but his reputation is slowly being reevaluated. Um, he's one of three authors I did my master's thesis on many years ago, and um, I, am, I am not a rational creature always about his uh, limitations. I'm a big fan, in other words. A little bit like Mark Twain, he is a Midwesterner who went from the Midwest, from Ohio, east. Uh, he was active as a young man in the Republican Party. And in those days, the Republicans were a new party, and they were the party that opposed slavery. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, if you remember from your history classes, was the first American Republican president. And he ran on a platform that not so much addressed the issue of slavery, but keeping the Union intact. Howells was an early uh, adherent of Lincoln and of the Republican Party, and he wrote uh, a campaign biography of Lincoln. And this is before we had television, before we had uh, the internet, you know, uh, before we had much in the way of a communications infrastructure besides uh, telegraph and newspapers. And so one of the ways that uh, presidential candidates would introduce themselves to the public is to have someone write a book about them, a campaign biography in this case, and this thing would have been disseminated all over the country. And so um, that's what Howells did, is he wrote a, um, a very laudatory biography of Lincoln uh, that was used as part of his campaign. Um, as a reward for this, uh, Lincoln appointed him the U.S. Consul to Venice, and that's where uh, Howells spent the Civil War. Unlike some of the other writers uh, in this period that we're studying, uh, Howells was out of the country during the entire war. Uh, during this period of time, he married Eleanor Mead, and you can see this is a photograph taken not too long after their wedding. Um, they had three children. Uh, they stayed married until she died. Um, he came back from the war, moved to Boston in 1865, not 1965. I apologize for the typo. And he became the editor of The Atlantic that was like one of the top three sort of uh, cultural criticism magazines of the period. The Atlantic is one of the oldest magazines in the United States and it's still published. In fact, I've been a subscriber since the early 1970s. Uh, during this period of time, he developed a friendship with Mark Twain, uh, helped him get his early stories published uh, in uh, broader circulation magazines like The Atlantic, um, and they stayed friends uh, throughout their lives. In, uh, from 1881 to 1891, he was a novelist, uh, he was a playwright, he was a, a he made his living as a writer, uh, and he was quite successful at it. He was asked to uh, edit a magazine called Cosmopolitan. And of course, you know, if you are um, if you ever go to a supermarket, Cosmopolitan is still around. It's a woman's magazine that focuses on fashion and, and beauty and, and things like that. But at the time, Cosmopolitan was a magazine very much like The Atlantic. Uh, it published fiction, nonfiction, travel essays, political stories. Um, but Howells only lasted a couple of years there, and then he left over some political differences. Um, Howells, it's hard to put labels on people like liberal or conservative uh, in the 19th century in the way that we do now, or left and right. But Howells, was, his politics were always on the side of the working man. Uh, the common people, because that's how he grew up. He grew up in, in pretty working class circumstances, and he kept that uh, orientation throughout his life. Um, at the same time that he was running magazines, uh, he, as I said, he was also a novelist and a critic and all that kind of stuff. Um, but he was also somebody who championed the use of realism, that is, stories that were about real people in real circumstances and real ways. And if you read his novels, The Rise of Silas Lapham is about a businessman, 
um, Hazard of New Fortunes is also about a uh, up and coming group of people who move from outside of society into society, kind of like the old Beverly Hillbillies show. And it talks about the pitfalls of suddenly coming into money and participating in a society uh, that we call the Gilded Age, this period of time that's very much like our own, where there's huge income inequality, there's a lot of turmoil between working class and rich people, uh, and so on. Um, <clears throat> Howells was an early opponent of the Spanish-American War. Twain, in contrast, supported it originally and then changed his mind after about a year. But the story that we have for this week, Aditha, comes from his opposition to the Spanish-American War. Uh, as I said at the beginning, he was a huge influence on 19th century American literature and letters, the world of, of sort of cultured people. Um, and his reputation suffered a decline the last maybe 10 or 15 years of his life as people sort of moved on from the kinds of, of literature that he championed. Um, but these days, his um, his reputation is being reappraised, I think partly because his politics are sort of suited to the time, and also partly because his aesthetic judgment tends to be pretty honest and not polemical, and he tends to deal with works of literature as they are, not that they fit into one particular camp or group or represent one political faction, but he looks at them from an old-fashioned kind of literary point of view, which I think these days some people find very refreshing. This is a little bit about the story that we have this week. It's a it's a simple story. Uh, Aditha is a woman who is engaged to a man named George uh, Gerson, and there's uh, the country is thinking of going to war, even though the war is not named. Um, it's the Spanish-American War, clearly. And um, Aditha thinks that George needs to enlist, that she doesn't think he's worthy of her unless he joins the uh, army and goes off to fight in this war. Um, George is not too enthusiastic about that. And as you see from the story, at one point he studied for the ministry, realized that he really didn't have the calling for it, and became a lawyer instead. Um, and in fact, he has a job in a town in New York where her father, where Aditha's father, owns a factory, owns a, a, an ironwork. George himself is from the Midwest, very much like Howell. Um, but George resists enlisting until there's like a recruiting event uh, in the town, and suddenly he gets caught up in the enthusiasm and not only enlists, but becomes captain of the local volunteer company. And of course, he goes off to war, as you know, and he's killed. Um, he had made Aditha promise before he left that if he does die, which Aditha dismisses completely, um, that she would visit his mother. And so that's what happens in the story. She goes out to the Midwest, to the farm where George had come from, visits his mother, who's a widow. Uh, and her husband had lost his arm in the Civil War and was virulently anti-war. And of course, Mrs. Gerson, the mother, is also equally anti-war. And she really confronts Aditha over the mourning that she's wearing. Um, she and George had never married, they've been engaged, um, but they had never, um, they were not a permanent couple in the sense that, you know, like a marriage would give them. And so Mrs. Gerson really takes Aditha to task over this. Okay, and so we see Aditha as this really kind of limited character. She's a shallow woman. Uh, she's sort of more concerned about how George appears to her than how George really is. And she's caught up in this war fever that clearly the uh, sort of the point of view of the story would suggest leads to some really terrible consequences, certainly for George. So Aditha doesn't come off very well. Uh, in this story. I'll be interested to see what you have to say about her in the discussion board. Um, one of the things that, that is pointed out frequently in the story is that she is a redhead. I have no idea if that means something, but we tend to associate redheads with, you know, mercurialness, with uh, being angry quickly, with being complicated characters. And I wonder if that's the reason that, that she is redheaded in this story. Uh, I should mention there aren't too many redheads in Howells' uh, fiction. I've read almost all of it uh, at one time or another. Um, 
but I will mention that about a third of his characters are Civil War veterans of one kind or another. And even in this story, uh, there is a Civil War veteran, George's father. We never meet him, but he certainly is somebody who animates the tale here. So one way to look at this story is to see it as an expression of William Dean Howell's own anti-war feelings, particularly about the Spanish-American War. But another way to look at it uh, is to look at Editha as being just as much a victim of circumstance um, as George is in, in some ways, because she is caught up in this fever that literally the whole country appears to be caught up in. And so someone like Mrs. Gerson really stands out as someone who is uh, against the war. She's clearly in the minority in terms of her feelings. But then the question comes up, well, where does the moral weight of the story lie? Does it lie with Editha? Does it lie with George? Does it lie with his mother? And I would put it to you that the story leaves us thinking that this is a much more complicated question than it appears. And again, I think uh, I'll be interested to see what you have to say when we do the discussion board.